Okay. Highly esteemed keynote speaker of this webinar, Dr. G. Ramanamurthy Garu, respected principal Dr. R. V. Krishnaya Garu, honorable director Professor N. Venkatrao Garu, HOD of ECE department Dr. N. Vijay Shankar Garu, and participants from various reputed institutions across the country. A warm and graceful afternoon to everyone. It's my immense pleasure and great honor to welcome you all on behalf of Chebrolo Engineering College to this webinar on future trends in CMOS technology at five nanometers and beyond, which is being organized by the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to the convener, Professor K. Manoj Pavan Kumar and the organizing committee who toiled hard and contributed with their thoughts in organizing this program. We are very grateful to the speaker for his kind acceptance and precious time. We assure you that he will kindle the fire of enthusiasm in all of us. I deem it great privilege to introduce the keynote speaker of this webinar, Dr. Gajula Ramana Murtigaru. He is a towering personality and a fountainhead of knowledge. He has been associated with the Faculty of Engineering and Technology, Multimedia University, Malaysia since 2005. Currently, Dr. Murthy is rendering his services as a professor in that institute. He has authored and co-authored several national and international publications and is also working as a reviewer for reputed professional journals. Dr. Murthy is actively associated with the different societies and academies around the world. He made his mark in the scientific community with his invaluable contributions gained wide recognition from honorable experts around the world. Dr. Murthy has received several awards for his contribution to the scientific community. A research interest involves engineering and technology. On behalf of Chebrol Engineering College, we cordially welcome Dr. Ramana Murtaru to offer insight into the topic of today's webinar, Future Trends in CMOS Technology at 5 Nanometers and Beyond. It's over to you, sir. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to show my gratefulness to meet all of you. I would like to candidates in place of the conventional mass spec uh, design along with certain software simulation uh, as well. As you know very well, in today's fab technology, going for any particular uh, node technology to design a fab-based fab design is quite expensive. Thereby, today's researchers mainly focus on simulation-based before they go for any fab design. Well, uh, where is the CMOS today as such? Uh, right now, we have a 14 nanometer commercially available technology node available, and we are moving down towards 10 nanometers, 7 nanometers, and then right now, one is uh, there, there are two companies already uh, successfully implemented 5 nanometers. Uh, one is uh, TSMC, that is uh, Taiwan's semiconductor manufacturing company, the other one is Samsung, our, our uh, mobile company, uh, the cellular company, the Samsung. These two companies have already successfully implemented, but it's not been commercialized yet. So right now the technology is uh, revolving around five nanometers. Even though it shows five nanometers, the effective length is actually 10 to 12 nanometers. The reason behind that is the unit uh, for any design is uh, approximated to two lambda, where lambda is the, your gate length. So the five nanometers, what we are representing here is with respect to the gate length, and the design uh, unit is two lambda, thereby it's actually 10 to 12 uh, effective length of your design. As we begin work on the five nanometer node, is there a new device technology? We should be seriously looking at it. Uh, that is the uh, problem and the question arising in many researchers' mind as of today. And we are going to have a detailed outlook like what kind of device alternatives that one researcher can really focus into. And it has gone beyond a, a, a simple uh, electronics engineer now. It has gone to various uh, research fields and it's a combination of uh, nanoscience, nanotechnology, uh, VLSI design, digital design. In even the physical expertise, all these kinds of expertise, it has become a teamwork at the moment. 
as we move through the slides it would be clearly evident like what are the challenges we are going to face as a researcher at 5 nanometers node uh, is what is uh, main uh, problem of concern for the researchers isn't it so there are a few highlighted here the first one is electrostatics then uh, we all know the parasitics the parasitic capacitances that that arise at every junction at every pn junction in your semiconductor device and leakages are popping up as your technology is shrinking now the conventional uh, mosfet design has become obsolete below 20 nanometer as all of us already know that now beyond uh, 20 nanometers researchers have been moved out of the conventional uh, uh, fet device and they are looking for the replacement candidates and then we are going to see some of those uh, uh, replacement candidates in place of a conventional uh, CMOS design. Like low voltage operation, when you are scaling down to 5 nanometer and even beyond that, I think the, the futuristic uh, 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 node, technology node has become, uh, I think is 3 nanometers, but uh, that is in future. At the moment, the technology is revolving around 5 nanometer node. What performance, like uh, the BDD is actually the supply voltage. The supply voltage has become now 0.5 volts. Earlier, when we were uh, introduced digital electronics, we were taught that 5 volts is considered as one digital logic one, and zero volts is considered as digital logic zero. That was the trend we started from TTL onwards, isn't it? So now that uh, 5 volts has come down to 0.5 volts. So VDD 0.5 volts means 0.5 volts level is considered as digital logic one now. And now, of course, digital logic zero is still uh, remains at uh, zero volts. So now the difference between logic one and zero is absolutely only 0.5 volts. In such case, what kind of <coughs> devices you should be really looking into to fulfill your performance and your requirements <coughs> and all those things, okay? So how does the device works when you are giving 0.5 volts as your VDD? How does it work? And why is it promising? You know, uh, like a conventional FET doesn't function anymore beyond 20 nanometer node. Then how about the other devices uh, they are promising for us? And what kinds of trade-offs we should be really looking into while focusing on certain design parameters? And where do we <clears throat> actually stand at the moment? And uh, this uh, webinar actually uh, several researchers, active researchers in this field, their contributions have been taken. The reason beyond that is, in order to benchmark any new outcome, being a researcher, you must have certain well-renowned researchers work as <clears throat> benchmark, isn't it? So in order to make that uh, visible, several renowned personalities' uh, output is considered as benchmark throughout the world. So those... Uh, findings are shown in this. Well, coming to the low voltage now, as I said now, 0.5 volts has become the logic one at 5 nanometer technology, right? So when, it, when you're talking about low voltage, what kinds of challenges we are going to face? Okay, now as you see here, I on is the on current when your device is turned on, right? And when we are, uh, this is actually happening when we see on, uh, this is a volt ampere characteristic curve of a normal conventional FET device where uh, VDS, that is the voltage between the drain and source is taken on X axis and the logarithmic plot of the drain current is taken on Y axis. So when you're plotting a graph like this, uh, we could easily see that this is VT, VT is our threshold voltage. The device runs in the normal mode after the threshold voltage, meaning to say that your conventional FET turns on beyond threshold voltage because threshold voltage is the voltage where it nullifies and it develops your inversion layer and your carrier starts moving from source to drain. Then sometimes people are, researchers are quite interested even below VT. That is what we call it a sub-threshold uh, current and sub-threshold region because once if you closely observe device doesn't turn off 
all of a sudden from an on state, isn't it? So this is where we are talking about an on state, where we are talking about I on, and this is where we are now talking about an off state, the true extreme ends of your curve. So in the process, the device doesn't turn off all of a sudden, right? So as we can see from the graph, there is certain amount of current that is still available in the device. And we call this current as sub-threshold current, or we call this as leakage current. And some researchers focus on why can't this amount of current actually turn on our devices and then they start focusing the research within this uh, uh, stipulated area itself. So they call it a sub-threshold region. Uh, many researchers explore the possibilities of research in this area itself, and we call that as a sub-threshold region. And now, the slope of this curve is called as sub-threshold slope. And greater than 60 millivolts per decade has become a nominal figure. The reason behind that is because of the limitation of the thermal voltage. Okay, Thermal voltage Vt is uh, Boltzmann constant K times K by Q, right? So in this K, Q by, v, this is the temperature, T by Q. So the temperature and Q are constants. It doesn't change with respect to your technology node. And whereas Boltzmann's constant K is also a constant parameter. So thereby, we have a limitation on thermal voltage. We, we would not be able to generate beyond that. So 60 millivolts per decade has become a uh, nominal uh, uh, parameter beyond that. You know, your, your circuit does not uh, produce carriers beyond that. Good. Now we move on to the next uh, approaches. Okay, what kind of approaches are quite uh, appropriate in this low voltage region? So we know very well that we wanted to move below 60 millivolts per decade if possible, which is not the case in case of a conventional uh, uh, MOSFET. And if there is any other devices which can fulfill this requirement, then obviously researchers are more intended to focus on those lines. As you see there, the black curve is a normal uh, conventional MOSFETs. And the red one is, we are talking about Three five FETs. What is this three five? Now many researchers who are known in this uh, field they know very well. It's actually we are now taking the elements from group three and group five from your periodic table, and these components, a combination of these elements, are used in place of silicon, uh, conventional silicon, in designing FETs. So thereby we call them as three five uh, category of FETs. Some of them are like nano-wired FETs, and even in some cases, BJTs are all aptly used. It's not that BJTs we wanted to use in place of an FET, but uh, as we run through the slides, we would know there is a physical presence automatically of a BJT inside the device structure. Then the blue option is more optimum compared to all the three uh, curves. And this is uh, the outcome of an internal gain. We call them as IFET. IFET stands for internal gain FETs. And we see some of those examples in today's uh, seminar, as well as TFETs like tunneling field effect transistors. So as you see, if you are looking mainly for subthreshold slope, the promising candidate is obviously internal gain FETs and TFETs. So like that, we cannot say that one particular design is you know renowned because you have your uh, trade-offs. I want more uh, uh, SS than maybe TFET is not the right candidate. So like that, depending upon our design requirements, you need to go for uh, various trade-offs between parameters. Okay, well, right now, let us have a recap because sometimes uh, I do understand that all the participants may not be well-versed in this field, so I thought uh, a last minute uh, inclusion of these slides like uh, short channel effects. What all the short channel effects and which may actually, if you ask me, short channel effects is considered as a research gap because whenever being a researcher, you wanted to explore in a new uh, expertise or new field in, in a uh, uh, well-defined uh, VLSI or well-defined devices or well-defined simulations. First of all, where we focus is the research gap where actually we can contribute, isn't it? So right now, if you focus on short channel effects of MOSFET devices, you would be coming across several research gaps. 
and one can actually pick from one of these gaps and from there he can intend to develop his research and then try to uh, contribute to the society. So some of the well-known uh, uh, short channel effects are highlighted here is ID is not linear anymore. Linear in the sense it's quadratically expressed in terms of mathematical expression earlier and that is with respect to the gate voltage and this does not fulfill anymore. Meaning to say our conventional drift diffusion model fails when you are looking into a short channel effects. Thereby the new terms are coming in like we call it as earlier whatever the mathematical uh, models using BSIM, uh, Berkeley simulation models we have been using all are based on conventional drift diffusion models. Now quasi uh, models are available, ballistic models are available, like the different kinds of models are available because we are now considering quantum mechanical effects as well in your uh, models and then uh, apart from classical <coughs> models, we incorporate even quantum mechanical confinement models are also incorporated inside. Then high voltage conductance. Uh, this is actually a, a, not a welcoming parameter. So your conductance, high output conductance actually uh, easily can drive the other uh, impact of other neighboring circuits, isn't it? So we must always have a high output impedance, thereby your circuit doesn't affect with other neighboring uh, circuit parameters like fan in and fan out. Then threshold voltage roll off. Threshold voltage roll off is one of the prominent uh, feature which is arising because of our short circuit channel effects. And uh, your uh, threshold voltage no more is going to be a constant as it was the case in long channels. And it varies with different parameters. And what are the parameters we are going to run through? Then increase the DABL. DABL means uh, drain induced barrier lowering. So we all know very well, under normal circumstances, when a carrier is moving from source to the drain, it has to cross certain electronic, uh, certain inbuilt energy barrier, isn't it? That's a Fermi barrier. Now, what happens is the gate voltage controls usually the barrier levels. At certain level, that is your threshold level, when gate voltage level comes to your threshold level, automatically this energy barrier level is nullified and your carrier is actually moving from source to the drain. This is what actually uh, our intention while designing any MOSFET. But now because the channel is reduced and we are now calling it as a short channel, the voltage at the drain also reduces the potential barrier. So thereby, slowly the gate is losing control over the carrier moment, which is not uh, a welcoming uh, parameter, right? So increasing DABL means when your DABL is increasing, your gate is obviously losing control over the carrier moments. Then increased SS, S is actually SS, subthreshold slope. If the subthreshold slope is increasing, then your design uh, doesn't turn off uh, automatically from an on state and it consumes a lot of leakage currents. Then the other one is a punch through, okay? And each one we see maybe quickly it, uh, details. Uh, this is the uh, thing I'm talking about. Under a long channel, when we see the volt ampere characteristic curve of a conventional MOSFET, it follows a certain conventional mathematical formula, right? A square law is, is implemented. So you see there by your current gets almost saturated towards the higher end of your drain source voltages. Similarly, low output conductance. <clears throat> These are the desired parameters in long channel and welcoming parameters, which we are going to miss when we move to a short channel. So thereby you see the drain current doesn't stagnate anymore. It actually exceeds certain level, okay? And it doesn't follow any more the normal conventional mathematical formula. Same is the case now you see the high output conductance. Obviously the output current increases, it obviously contributes the output conductance as well. Thereby your output conductance also increases. And these two are actually 
uh, not welcoming parameters in short channels. Okay, the next one is channel length modulation. Most of us have heard about this name, channel length modulation. Now we know very well, th this is a conventional uh, bulk FET device where we have uh, the blue colored one is the substrate. And we have a source terminal here. And we have a drain terminal here. And this is our gate. And this gate is actually, we uh, implant the gate through a insulator. Okay, SiO2, silicon dioxide is a conventional insulator used. Now what happens is, if this gate length is becoming less and less, like I said now, five nanometer is the current technology, right? So the gate length here is five nanometer. So the channel length is reduced. The minute the channel length is reduced, automatically your gate voltage is also reduced because they are directly proportional. Thereby your threshold voltage level is reduced and your VDD is also reduced. So these are all interconnected. So now this is the normal practice. Now instead of this, if this, somehow this channel length is reduced without our intention. Uh, that problem is considered as channel length modulation because this internal length further deteriorates our threshold voltage, further deteriorates our uh, VDD, which are not actually intended as per our design, right? So now the voltage level at the drain is the main cause for a punch through or pinch of region moving closer and closer, right? Thereby your channel length is further reduced. A high voltage at the drain makes your pinch off penetrates deeper into the gate, thereby reducing the length of the gate, thereby reducing threshold voltage. Meaning to say, we do not have a predetermined control of the threshold voltage because of the high voltage at the drain. So now channel since it's reduced, so you see the drain current is actually the mobility of the affected carriers and oxide thickness with respect to the width and the length. Length is the effective length of your channel and suppose VGS minus VT, VT is the threshold voltage. So this is a conventional formula valid even for short regions. This is applicable when VGS is greater than the threshold as well as VDS is in between that of the VGS and VT. Now, when the channel is becoming too short, now no more we call it as, uh, it's been controlled by only the VDS. Now you see on Y axis, we see the VDS. That is what we call it as a voltage connected between the drain and the source. And X, there is one more coming here, right? That is your gate voltage. Okay, now you can ask one question. Why is it that gate voltage was also there earlier, right? Now why you are calling it as like a two, dimensional fields, you know. As the channel is becoming lower and lower and reduced to a short channel level, then your gate level also has a predominant effect on the movement of your carriers. That's why it has become two dimensional when you're reducing the channel length. Okay, the one more short channel effects is VT roll off. As I said earlier, your threshold voltage is actually reduced by a certain parameter, right? So the delta VT is actually called as VT roll off. How much it's been reduced and what is the physical relationship between the amount of the gate uh, voltage as well as your, your channel length. So we have a, a conventional uh, methods and a lot of research is done under this area. Okay, now if you see the red line is actually the one going down and this is a conventional uh, threshold voltage roll off curve. So how about this one, the dotted one? Uh, this is named as reverse short channel effect. What is suddenly why a new thing is coming in, a reverse short channel effect. Reverse short channel effect is actually coming because of hollow doping. Uh, what is the hollow doping? Hollow doping is actually in certain advanced devices, what they do is they vary the doping levels at uh, source, at the channel, at the 
uh, drain levels. So they increase uh, high end doping at the source as well as high end doping at the drain compared to the channel as such. So that, that causes your depletion layer at the drain end deeply penetrates now because of the higher doping and sometimes it may even touch your source thereby certain voltages are internally developed at the substrate level itself so this voltage opposes your conventional gate voltage thereby to turn on the inversion layer your gate level voltage should be higher so that is what is actually reverse short channel effects so when people are going for one kind of a research unnecessarily they are coming up with unknowing side effects so reverse short channel effect is one of the side effect of your hollow doping technologies and uh, like i already discussed drain induced barrier lowering right so whenever your voltage at the drain is becoming higher and higher then obviously it reduces the energy band diagram uh, apart from the gate so and the, slowly the gate is losing control over the carrier movement from source to the drain so this is usually in the order of millivolts per volt uh, and uh, it has uh, on a conventional curve we can actually see when vds is 0 0.1.1 volt so if this is the curve and vds is 0 0.05 volts this is the curve and if they are uh, looking like a linear relationship there is no big issue they don't become linear at some stage. Uh, this is where your short channel effects are becoming more stronger and it doesn't follow any linear relationships. And this is even uh, severe, right? So like that. And this may be the reason of uh, a punch through, okay? Punch through means, what is the punch through? Okay, maybe we see that. Sometimes because of uh, excess uh, <clears throat> lateral field strength. No, now we are calling them as two terms. Okay, one is a coaxial electric field and lateral electric field. Or you can say conventional uh, x x direction and conventional y direction. X direction is actually the voltage applied between the drain and source VDS, and lateral field is your VGS between gate and the substrate. Now, since the length of the gate is reduced, reduced. Earlier, the, even though there was a VGS, it was not affecting any carrier movement from source to the drain. Now, since the gate is reduced, reduced length of the gate is reduced and it's becoming short channel, now the impact of this gate voltage and the movement of the carriers is also coming into consideration. Now, they get surface scattering. Now, what happens is excess voltage, positive voltage at the gate, your electrons are getting attracted and then there's instead of moving straight away from source to the drain, they get collided with the surface of SASIO interface. So we call this phenomenon a surface scattering. Due to the surface scattering, a high mobile carriers get surface scattering at the surface of SASIO interface. The carriers reaching at the day drain and automatically minimizes. So punch through is, uh, is not actually that. The one I'm talking about is the surface scattering. Punch through is like high mobile carrier now punches through the barrier. It doesn't actually wait for the gate applied voltage and then gain energy and then cross the barrier. It actually has a high energy because of the lateral field that it punches to the barrier. So thereby you have additional amount of carriers reaching the drain region. That is actually the punch through concept. It punches to the barrier because of the excess lateral fields. Okay, what kind of uh, simulation models right now available for any researchers to do a benchmarking, right? So I'm considering like one of the well-renowned MIT VS, uh, and in short, we call it as MVS model. This model is uh, quite uh, renowned. And if you are starting in this area, I do recommend you to use this model as your benchmark model. If, uh, if your design, comes beyond any one of the, you know, say for example, better results than this existing model, then you can obviously consider your work is quite predominant and you can go straight away for publication. A simple uh, MIT, uh, MIT, of course, all of us know, there's a uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and VS is, uh, stands for Virtual Source 
transportation model and they have and it's actually you can download that it's a freeware and now actually they have a, even a third version mes3 model is available and this includes uh, fd fermi dirac statistics and non parabolicity are all included and quasi uh, quantum mechanical models are incorporated as i said now simple drift diffusion models have become obsolete now people are moving for either quasi uh, quasi quantum models or complete uh, quantum models complete quantum models are not actually well versed with technocrats like us so thereby we use still classic mechanics in with uh, uh, quantum mechanical confinements adoption adoption so improved uh, capacitance model that is due to quantum effects then semi empirical uh, electrostatic so this is what i'm telling like uh, quasi quantum mechanical effects then uh, predicts uh, injection velocity complete uh, iv characteristics are ready made available as a benchmark from m uh, m star m star may be a, a new term for some of us this is what is actually the electron uh, mobility okay mobility of the weight of the electron then mobility then uh, l effective actual length uh, effective length of the gate and degeneracy sometimes uh, they degenerate meaning to say what what is de degeneration before the carrier moves from the source to the destination they it, some of them may recombine due to excess holes in the device in the substrate that leads to degeneracy okay so this is where uh, we can actually download the uh, the mit vs models now the current version i checked the other day was a 3 model 3 is available that is still uh, applicable for fine nanometer device technology and our research can be benchmarked with the conventional well world worldwide recognized bench models from these uh, uh, nano hub we can compare from there there by you know uh, at what level actually our research is actually heading to and if i sincerely suggest if your findings are somewhere on par or somewhere below than findings of this then obviously our work is not that pronounced and then i think we should do some more additional work to extend okay we have quickly glanced through some of the short channel effects right so these are the research gaps some someone focuses right now on only sub threshold slope somebody focuses only on threshold voltage roll off somebody focuses only upon output conductance uh, so all can focusing on all these parameters is absolutely not possible because bottleneck you you actually try to uh, you know trade off between certain parameters and improve on certain parameters i i, I don't mind having additional sub threshold slope at the expense of some other parameter uh, as a, at, at the you know gain of some other parameter and so on okay so now low voltage silicon benchmark so that's what now we are going to go through in some slides the conventional 14 nanometer finfet technology output results are shown here from uh, some researchers natarajan et al is uh, one indian as well so we can see the <clears throat> 14 nanometer cmos finfet technology output with respect to your vds and as well as drain current for both Uh, because it looks like a replica, isn't it? Because one end is the P mass, another end is the N mass. So if you don't want to visualize on P mass, we can only focus on the right hand side of the graph. Same is the case <coughs> here also. We just with respect to the drain current for N mass as well as P mass. So these are the conventional benchmark results if you are working on FinTech. <clears throat> okay so what do you do now no, i'm talking about chandni the finfet right finfet is no more a, a planar device it's actually a vertical uh, platform right so now if you are working on a planar device platform then can i still use these conventional benchmark models to to you know assess my work yes it can be done so they have given one method for that map the finfet to an equivalent planar structure then divide measure current per micron by 2 because that is a uh, Uh, you know, vertical structure, right? Then uh, 
fit the 14 nanometer Intel data with a planar model, then actually you can start benchmarking your models. Okay. And those models are shown here. Uh, this is after converting FinFET model to a planar model. I am designing a planar structure. I am not going for a FinFET design, but still I can use this MES model data as my benchmark data. And then uh, if I could design a device which shows a better performance compared to these benchmark models, then I can right, right away say that our device is much better than the, uh, some of these findings. Okay, so the EOD is actually the equivalent oxide thickness and L effective length is the gate length, subthreshold swing, some standard values are given because when you're simulating your device, uh, the device will ask you to input with certain parameters, right? So these are the parameter values input before the simulation gives you the output waveforms like this. So thereby, these parameters are already listed out. If, if you say, if EOD is 0.8 nanometer, I had a better result then, then your benchmarking is not right. So you need to go with the same kind of key parameters before you use a benchmark results. So thereby, uh, effective mobility is also shown, then MT. Okay, now the weight, right? Carrier weight, M, M stands for the carrier weight. Carrier weight is also defined into uh, two. One is trans transverse, that is on uh, vertical field, as well as another one is the longitudinal on the horizontal axis. And there are the conventional formulas like 0.19 M0 and 0.8 M0. This is taken from the silicon structure, okay? Three-dimensional silicon structure. In a three-dimensional silicon structure, basically uh, the third dimension, ML1 and ML2, uh, ML1 and ML2 are equal in a silicon structure. Therefore, so we have only a two-dimensional MT, traverse and vertical line, I mean on y-axis and on x-axis. So the effective mass, actually, the, it's a carrier moving means what? your mass, electron mass is moving. That is the movement of the mass, isn't it? So when the mass is moving, it's not only moving in one direction on x-axis like earlier, where we are talking about a long channel. So it's actually moving in both the directions, x as well as y-axis. So that's why the M is further divided into two parts like MT as well as ML. Traverse on vertical axis as well as on horizontal line. Some more uh, results on that. Benchmark LV, low voltage, high performance silicon, N MOSFET, focusing on the N MOSFET alone. So if I'm not working on a FinFET, I'm working only on a conventional N MOSFET using conventional silicon. And if your technology goes until 20 nanometer, because as I said, a conventional uh, silicon MOSFET ceases to function beyond 20 nanometer. If I'm talking about 14 nanometer, obviously our silicon uh, planar silicon model doesn't function anymore because your drift diffusion model becomes obsolete. So you need to move on to either quasi uh, quantum mechanical effects or completely uh, ballistic, quasi ballistic or completely ballistic approach transport. Okay, that is where we are now showing the 20 nanometer model here, again with the same uh, benchmark. I can uh, very, uh, uh, what do you say, conformly say that research on a conventional planar N MOSFET has almost come to an end, okay? So if you are looking into that line, then uh, that's not the right path because the research has already ceased in that line, meaning to say nobody is now doing a conventional CMOS design using a N MOSFET planar devices no more because it has ceased beyond 20 nanometer level. That's what even our, uh, sometimes it's good to go for IDRS, uh, even uh, uh, IRTS, okay? Uh, and IRTS is also has become obsolete beyond 2016. Now IRDS, International Roadmap for Devices and Systems. Earlier they used to call it as International Roadmap for Semiconductors. And uh, that is obsolete after 2016. And we are new name, okay? The, a lot of researchers from uh, academic institutions and industries, they come up with uh, new findings and they have a protocol. Okay, and again, uh, EOT is 20 nanometers. As I said, uh, 
silicon nano uh, and, and MOSFET means your minimum gate length should be 20 nanometers. And this data can be used as a benchmark for our findings, research findings, and can actually check on that. That's a conventional silicon and MOSFET. Okay, now we are moving at, uh, as I said, 20 nanometer means you said conventional uh, silicon and MOSFET is not available. Then what are the other possibilities where the researchers must focus into beyond 20 nanometers is high channel. One of the uh, candidate is high channel mobility MOSFETs. Another candidate is nanowire FETs. Another candidate is internal gain FETs. Another candidate is P FETs. Then the last but not the least one is 2D channel materials. Okay, these are all the promising candidates in place of a conventional MOSFET. Okay, we go one by one uh, into a brief details. Okay, now it's the time to move into atomic table, group three and group five MOSFETs, no more simple silicon and simple germanium, right? So some recent results shows a better achievements compared to a conventional silicon and germanium by moving into the uh, three, five group from the periodic table elements, combination of these group three and group five elements. And uh, some findings are shown here. And these outputs are shown at 25 nanometers and uh, 80 nanometers, because we should be able to say, my device works very well only at the short channel. That's not our aim, right? The outcome should also work as at the long channel level, at, again, at the short channel level. So thereby, the findings are shown even at the higher end, 25 nanometers and 80 nanometers as well. First, make sure that your device functions at the long channel platform and then you move to the short channel platform and then see that the short channel effects are not that predominant in our design. Not necessarily to be all the short channel effects, maybe some, some of them by, uh, you know, trade off with some other parameters. That is the idea of the current researcher at the moment. Okay, so the reason why we are moving to the group three and five uh, in a periodic table MOSFETs compared to the conventional uh, silicon and germanium is, as you see here, the mobility is good. You have a high mobility, okay, then uh, high injection velocity as well. When you start giving, what, what do you mean by injection velocity? Uh, you, a new term, isn't it? Earlier we used to call it as a drift velocity because of the voltage given by the gate or voltage given from the drain and source terminals. That is what is called the drift velocity. Now, the voltage given at the gate is actually injects additional carriers into the channel. Thereby, it injects additional velocity into the channel. So we call a new term as injection velocity now. Okay, uh, this happens uh, uh, with small m. If the mass of your carrier is quite heavy, then injection velocity may not be that predominant anymore. So by looking at the small mass, you are able to move a little bit mass and thereby injecting injection velocity. This happens at near ballistic performance. Okay, now I, I would like to give a simple explanation on this ballistic performance as this term is uh, maybe relatively new to some of us. Okay, when we are seeing a movement of the carrier from the source to the drain, then what happens is you, we assume that the carrier is moving in a straight line, correct? When the carrier is moving from the source to the drain, carrier in the sense your electron is moving from the source to the drain in a straight line. Uh, this movement is what is we wanted, right? So that is what is called ballistic performance but is it happening in reality to some extent can say uh, to some extent can say uh, can assume not in fact can say can assume it's happening in a long channel but definitely not in a short channel because as I said surface scattering is happening because of the lateral field because of the field appeared at the gate right your electron is getting attracted by the excess positive gate voltage and it gets collided with the silicon as I want to interface. And this is what is called collisions happening, right? And if your carrier before going 
to the drain, how many times it's getting collided with the surface. Uh, that amount you know, is getting degrade, degradation, right? Mobility degradation. Now, the carrier movement before colliding with the boundaries is a new term is called character, mean free path time of your carrier. What is the mean free path time of your carrier means? My carrier mean free path time is like two, means it gets collided two times. It's three, you say it gets collided three times. A three nanometer, within the three nanometer range, it gets collided. So that's how we start calling more into the physical terms now. So near ballistic performance is my carrier is without getting scattering, it reaches to the destination. That's what is more predominant in three, five MOSFETs compared to the conventional MOSFETs. And then what are the uh, trade-offs uh, at the expense of what you are achieving all these things? One is low DOS. DOS means density of states. And gate capacitance is also reduced to some extent. Okay, if gate capacitance, uh, we are now talking about para parasitic capacitances, right? Parasitic capacitance are, are negative effects, whereas gate capacitance is positive effect. Why? Because the more the gate capacitance, the, the faster you have an inversion layer formation at the channel, right? So thereby, which is essential parameter. So gate capacitance should be high in order to turn your device into an inver inversion layer and your channel turns on very quickly, thereby reducing your threshold voltage. Except gate, gate capacitance, remaining all other capacitance are classified as parasitic. Okay? Except gate capacitance, all other capacitors in your FET are classified as parasitics. They are not uh, uh, mean, meaning to say contributing to our uh, performance. So you are, you are uh, at the expense of gate capacitance, you are able to achieve these parameters. Okay, coming to the DOS, we never heard this term earlier because we were using drift diffusion models to simulate our conventional MOSFETs. But when the minute you incorporate, uh, what do you say, quantum mechanical models, the density of states are considered to be uniform throughout the channel region in drift diffusion models, which is not the case in reality. The density of states gets, you know, as the distance from the channel to the surface of the silicon and silicon uh, SIO2 interface, the density of the states actually getting reduced. The carriers are not widely distributed, like how at the center of the channel, the edges. Okay, then that's what I mean to say. So that is what is the reason when you talk about the convention, I mean, quantum mechanical effects means you are talking into more reality. When I'm talking about drift diffusion model means I'm assuming the carriers are uniform throughout the channel. I don't consider they are low at the, at the edges, meaning to say at the interface, which is the reality is actually low. Then tunneling. Tunneling is, uh, is a good parameter as well as bad. It depends on how you are looking into. When I'm talking about uh, say gate tunneling, meaning to say the electrons are tunneling through the gate because of the thickness of the oxide is too small uh, then that tunneling is actually not uh, the needed tunneling but if the carrier is tunneling from the valence band of the uh, source to the conduction band of the intrinsic material and it's reaching the drain or uh, means the tunneling is the needed tunneling so it depends on what kind of tunneling we are talking about then source uh, source starvation is another uh, trade-off. With these trade-offs, your three, five uh, group elements, MOSFETs, actually gain high mobility, high injection velocity, and near ballistic performance. And we have conventional, I do not go to too much up into mathematics, uh, because uh, sometimes uh, that, that may not be appropriate with the uh, given uh, participants. So we have uh, mobility and injection velocities already defined with this uh, three, five families for the 20 nanometers. Okay, now as you see here, uh, of course most of us uh, with minimum background can easily understand these things. But coming here, uh, MFP, MFP means, as I said now, mean free paths, right? Mean free paths. Now two means at least two times for a 20 nanometer uh, gate length, your carrier gets collided two times before it reaches to the drain destination. 
us. So that's what it indicates. Okay, that is what is happening in silicon. Whereas in the Mars right, uh, that is what I'm talking about. The three five uh, table, right? See the MFP is here. To what extent it's minimized? So meaning to say, approximately 0.1. The possibility of getting is out of 100 is only one. So almost near ballistic operation. So the surface scattering is not happening. The carrier is not getting collided with the boundaries, like which is the case at least two times in case of the silicon conventional uh, uh, CMOS device. Whereas here, if instead of silicon, if I'm using a India Mars night at 35, then I'm able to minimize the collisions. And almost it's becoming near ballistic operation. And we see the, the curve, okay? Also increasing bonds of ball ballistic mobility. So your improvement also can be shown. And it's already, the research is already done in this line as well. With 3.5 is also no more uh, uh, prominent now, okay? Earlier to some extent, yes. Conventional MOSFET moved straight away into a group three, group five was the stage. And up to 40 nanometers, even 10 nanometers, they were promising candidates. Okay, certain bottleneck. Now, what's happening here? Bottleneck DOS, uh, as I said, the uh, uh, DOS density of states bottleneck, right? So, the density of states bottleneck is actually overcome with few layers of gates. And now, uh, when we are thinking about a conventional MOSFET, we have only one gate, right? So, now, different layers of gates and, and maybe some of our researchers would have heard the name heterogate heterogate means uh, they usually have two you know types of gates in one layer itself maybe the one one is a three five another one is a conventional SIO2 uh, another one is by using galley mass right so two layers of gates are formed so different operations of this gate so all these changes we wanted to take place only at the end of the source source Terminal. So uh, they have a 35 uh, um, element uh, as a, an insulator at the source end and a conventional SIO2 towards the gate end. So this type of gate is called a conventional gate. So meaning to say, across the length of the gate, different materials are used as insulators. But here, what we are seeing is this is the next level. In simulations, what we are trying to do is different layers of gates are deposited. So EOT, me as I said, uh, equivalent oxide thickness up to 0 0.0 nanometer. I have one silicon, one uh, insulator using a SA, and that's just three pi. And maybe here I have another conventional. Thereby I improve the gate capacitance. Like I already said, gate capacitance higher the better. Okay, except the gate capacitance, remaining all other capacitance are considered as parasitics in a conventional MOSFET. And some benchmarks again by using that. For three five, uh, last time we have seen the conventional benchmark uh, from one uh, renowned researchers for a conventional and mass spec. Now we are seeing for three five materials. So the three five silicon is uh, somewhere blue, and three five is the you can see the improvement, right? So instead of using a conventional germanium and silicon. Um, to manufacture your MOSFET in designing your MOSFET. If you go to a 3 5 materials, a combination of this, then your performance obviously improves. And as I said, your off current is not zero. So obviously, you improve on certain parameters, you are popping up with some unnecessary, unwanted parameters as well. But in order of pickup, amperes is, is actually negligible. Okay, so we would like to now summarize uh, high mobile, high channel mobile, uh, okay, candidates. Gate capacitance and injection velocity are trade off results in performance uh, that is similar to silicon. Other materials like germanium and band structure engineering to increase the DOS without lowering the velocity should also is the research gap here. 
if one can implement these things then it can be considered as a novelty then tunneling will increase leakage this is the tunneling we are now talking about the tunneling to the gate okay so the gate tunneling is always a leakage band to band tunneling is is is, is required okay so the importance of tunneling is actually through the band to band is shown here when the your gate length is 4 nanometer 7 nanometer with respect to different uh, technology nodes 10 nanometer and here is 13 nanometer and so on and this uh, tunneling we see when it comes to the tft is more in detail okay so the next one is the nano wire tfts this is another promising candidate for in place of conventional tfts so as you could see here cnt carbon nanotube uh, some of us have heard this name right it's like a graphene sheet and this graphene sheet is rolled into a tube carbon nanotube we call that as a carbon nanotube and the way in which you 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 know you mold that into a tube in, in the clarity of the tube also varies and actually carbon nanotube is a two dimensional tube right so you have a normal longitudinal tube long uh, axis as well as chirality chir axis so n a1 plus m a2 it's a two dimensional array then n minus m is 3i where i is integer then it's it's metallic if n is equals to m is also metallic in elsewhere it becomes semiconductor so it, it it's, it's a complete uh, uh, research on its own the cnt fet is carbon nanotube so in nano wire fet is a carbon nanotube is used in place of a conventional silicon and you have uh, a tremendous improvement in terms of the carrier movements like tunneling and a simple gate cannot control in a in a, in a nano wire fet is you must have a gaa kind of gate gate all around meaning to say throughout the tube you actually etch the gate layer then only we should be able to control the movement because it's like almost near uh, uh, you know uh, the, this uh, moment ballistic near ballistic moment so here <clears throat> the layers are uh, like uh, like close to the thing and somewhere intermediate and somewhere bottom so the tunneling is classified into different regions one is ibt okay inter, inter uh, band intra band like con uh, conventional valence band to conduction band like that intra band tunneling then band to band tunneling then hibl because of certain holes also induced barrier lowering tunneling and btbt is three is the, the bottom most tunneling so like that they classify it and we are mainly focusing on only ibt intra band uh, tunneling and the results are shown here by some research and they are the benchmarks again so why i am showing certain results is if you choose this candidate as your research field as a replacement for a conventional fet then you must look into these benchmarks and your outcome should be at least on par with this or beyond this then we can say we have done a considerable work considerable work in this field like that that is the reason why i have shown some even though they do not actually uh, show a complete explanation then uh, imaginary band structure for the sake of fulfilling a complete graph they actually mirror the image here so this part is actually imaginary mirror image same is the case this part is the mirror image so the plot is actually only from this part then uh, some other projections on nano wire fets so like that nano wire fet is another promising candidate as i said in nano wire fet ga is required gate all around in order to control the movement of the carriers because it's almost a uh, near ballistic movement of the carriers from one end to another another end like a pool like like your tube you know water tube like what is flowing from one end to another end so electrons are moving you know in a ballistic near ballistic movement so to control that movement you must have a thoroughly controlled gate 
wrapped throughout the <coughs> tube. How much effective width can be put into required gate pitch? Uh, these are all the uh, considerations when you are looking into this area. Okay. Then fin feds compared with nano wires. Actually, nano wire uh, is also uh, quite good candidate. So they see silicon fin fat here, one fin, and one nano wire GAA gate uh, <clears throat> all around compared with that. Then two nano wire GAA, three nano wire GAA, and, and you can have multiples of that. Then we are moving on to the next one <clears throat> internal. Am I running out of time? Uh, shall I continue? Okay, internal gain FETs, I, I mass. I mass is, as I said, internal gain uh, mass fits. Okay, then in that there is one uh, fer ferroelectric, right? FETs and then uh, uh, some other NEM. This is actually going more towards the mechanical field. So here we will have a negative capacitance as well. Why? Why a negative capacitance? Federal electric, um, why we are going for that is in order to have a negative uh, uh, capacitance as well. well I, I will show you the reason for that. So as you see here, one is the entire MOSFET model can be classified into a combination of two series capacitances. One is at the insulator and the interface. The other one is at the substrate. Okay, a combination of these two. So the total capacitance becomes uh, series capacitance or a parallel combination, isn't it? C1, C2 by C1 plus C2, which is either less than C1 or less than C2. Okay. Now, in order to, if I can make this capacitance as variable, is it possible? Yes, that is possible to the ferroelectric. Okay, ferroelectric materials are used in order to have a variable substrate capacitance thereby i can have certain say on the capacitance as well ferroelectric materials are used to do that and some standard equations to in order to if you are interested in this domain they are useful and the observations are also shown here and the energy band structure for ferroelectric materials Uh, this is where we can see a negative negative capacitance okay uh, this one if uh, anyone is interested in this line they can actually can uh, write to me uh, we like i said in quantum mechanical effects what is the dos density of states are not uniform that's one of the quantum mechanical effect and uh, quantum uh, reflections then another one is the conduction band is not uniform throughout the channel okay the conduction band is actually edge conduction band edge is tilted at the surface uh, this is uh, there are two types of things are available polar okay uh, this is one dot model they call it uh, and we have an approximation mathematical models for that to what extent it's actually tilted at the interface so that is why you see that it's tilted there bend And in some cases, we may have a, a floating metal gates as well. Okay, instead of using a, a, a metal gate, we can actually improve the performance of the capacitance. When I use a metal gate, it increases mass capacitance, uniform potential for each grain, and leakage paths are logic timings are the problems. Okay, so positives are these are the positives. And negatives are these are the negatives. So as I said, for each candidate, we have plus as well as minus. And again, when you are going for a ferroelectric uh, materials to improve the capacitance of the gate and all those things, then you need to have a comparison to benchmark devices. And these are the benchmark devices, and uh, it's a, a ferroelectric FET. Okay, uh, very log models can be downloaded from this website. And the results can be compared with your findings in order to 
show that we have done a considerable amount of research. So this is another candidate. So the novelties are like novel device concept, the potentially significant impact, encouraging results are emerging out because of these FEPTs. Significant challenges remain uh, in terms of the materials. Okay, one has to do a different. Uh, uh, material integration and intensive speed and reliability and a lot of research is getting done at this moment only at the simulation level not on the fab level and the next one is tfet is tunneling uh, field effect transistors tunneling field effect transistors actually you have one combination of p i and n okay p i n and i n is intensive semiconductor p is the p type semiconductor and n is the n type semiconductor so here, what we do is dopings are uh, varied. The valence band, when I apply the gate voltage at the gate terminal, the valence band, the valence band and the conduction band of your valence band of your source and the conduction band of your intrinsic material, they come closer to each other. Then your electron tunnels to the band to balance. And if I reduce the voltage level at the gate, then again there is a gap between these levels. That can be actually shown here. So by applying the gate voltage, we bring this uh, band closer so that the gate can, I mean the carrier can tunnel to the band to band. So that's how the movement is. It's not because of electro, no more like your conventional uh, uh, energy band diagram. It's actually tunneling to the band to the band. By controlling the gate voltage. That is the logic behind our tunneling field effect transistors. And they are the quite promising candidate at, at the moment. Even the off state uh, is quite good. Leakage currents can be minimized by using this. And some of the conventional, uh, I mean, the benchmark models for emission models. I mean, all these are all. Uh, Channeling uh, field effect transistors move outputs for on state as well as for off state. Uh, this is actually non equilibrium green function simulations by using TCAT, okay, silver for TCAT simulations. And it shows a quite good. Uh, so that's why a lot of research is now going in, in the field of uh, heterogate TFETs because they, are, they seem to be more promising candidates. And uh, the board, uh, the structure of this is shown here. One is P, I, N, that is the conventional method. And heterogate means I use a different material to, uh, to design P, similarly to design N. Here I am using a 3, 5, all right? And here I am using also 3, 5. Here is a 3, 5. So in that way, uh, TFETs are, are more prominent. Nanowire also is prominent, promising candidates. As I said, each each candidate has certain pros as well as certain cons. Interesting device concept that could outperform subthreshold uh, silicon CMOS in ultra powers. Okay, subthreshold slope is quite good in TFETs. Significant and growing body of exponential experimental results still looking for a breakthrough. Serious challenges must be addressed, like increasing on current without increasing leakage, scaling below 10 nanometers, maintaining subthreshold swing below 60 to higher currents. There are all some of the challenges. Okay, then two dimensional channels are another one that is another promising candidate. Transition metal dicolagenates, TMED, in short, we call it as MOS2. MOST means molybdenum uh, disulfide, and WSET is like uh, tungsten diselenide. These are the materials we use as a two, 2D semiconductors. They are quite ultra thin in terms of atomic scale channels and atomically smooth as well. No dangling bonds, stackable uh, heterojunctions, uniform thickness can be achieved, mobility maintained through thin channels. All those things are, uh, this is the general structure. Even I am not uh, come, uh, widely exposed into 2D TMD. My research is mainly towards TFETs and nanowire FETs. This is a relatively new field coming into uh, where as a good research gap, if one is interested, they can actually 
focus into this line as well. Okay, conventional SI, double gate, and SOI silicon on insulator. They are comparing the results with all these models and they outperform them. Okay, this is a high performance and this is for low standby powers. Even the leakage is so minimized. And effective mass, as I said, the carrier movement is actually reflected in terms of the effective mass movement in quantum mechanical models. Okay, so this is an excellent alternate candidate if you are looking for a research in this line. Result in ultra thin body and reasonably large effective mass, thereby your mobility, I mean, as well as your currents are higher. Double gate implementation is a challenge in this. Doping and contacts and mobility, etc. Device optimization is also a challenge. Actually, most of these candidates, even though you come up with some successful uh, designs in terms of simulations, how far they are feasible in terms of fab designs? Uh, that is one, one challenge. Okay, so vertical TFTs, now we are looking into, into two dimensional from TMEDs. Is it possible? Uh, can we research can progress into this line? Is one of the active area now in the research? And some atlas based uh, simulation models uh, results are shown. As I said, they are quite uh, challenging candidates, promising candidates as well. Okay, now I think uh, we have seen quite a few alternate candidates and promising candidates in place of conventional mass fed like high channel mobility MOSFETs, nanowire FETs, internal gain FETs, TFETs, and 2D channel materials as some of the promising candidates. We can focus any one in these and can benchmark, uh, the benchmarks shown in this uh, seminar. If we can compare our results in our design with these benchmarks, then I can confirmly say that we have done a considerable uh, amount of work in that line. And if you want to download the simulations, this is the site from where you can download. And uh, summaries, all device options face a similar set of challenges, right? Cost of fabrication, lithography. So that's the reason nowadays everything is on virtual fab, no more physical fabs. Increasing role of parasitics, okay? Gate capacitance and series uh, resistance, variability, electrostatics, and leakage especially in tunneling. Difficulty of achieving desired ion of ratio and reducing uh, VDD. No device that's distinctly superior to silicon uh, has been identified as on date. So silicon is a still a possibility, but will it offer enough performance? Okay, the fine nanometer node and all. And as I said, right now, the fine nanometer node implemented by Samsung and uh, the TSMC is actually uh, using a FinFET GAA gate all around uh, and using SY technology. That is a combination of these three models. High mobility channels could work with careful considerations of trade offs, germanium MOSFETs, maybe ferroelectric mass FETs and TFETs and 2D metals is not ready for fine nanometer mode development, but should be watched. Okay, beyond certainly not silicon anymore. It is, silicon is still somewhere there, but not completely on that. Electrostatic control will require nanowire or ultra thin chan channels in DT architecture, double gate architecture. Leakage will be dominated by tunneling. And FEFTs, TFTs, and 2D metals could be the answer for that. Okay, so the, again, uh, as I said, uh, this is where we begin. We are ending the same way. And it's not until it's uh, over. Okay. I think uh, I'm open for any questions. I think I'm done. But each each field, yes. Anybody wants to ask any question? Please raise, uh, please raise your hand. Okay. They, they can even mail me if they if they have time. Yes. Request all the participants if you have any questions, uh, uh, you can make, uh, drop a mail to the search mail ID and I will provide the mail ID.
and or you can simply raise your hand so that we will unmute you one second sir vikram kumar sir what uh, can you throw light about the power dissipation problems because when the size is getting reduced power yes. dissipation problem into picture no sir yes yes actually uh, uh, we are mainly looking for only the power dissipation part of it see when when, when we are talking about when we are reducing the size automatically the power uh, dissipations are minimized right so all the candidates what we discussed here are ultimately contributing towards the power consumption Yeah. We can have a, a detailed session on maybe once on power dissipation alone. You know where we can discuss about uh, power uh, delay product and multiplication of that. If the delay is minimized, power is minimized, PDP is automatically minimized. Thereby, for that we need to have a complete design on a model. Maybe we can go for an analog design or a digital design. Maybe a full adder or a comparator. Then we can show more details on this power. calculations but all the candidates in today's seminar certainly contribute for minimum power consumption yeah still is there anyone uh, who wants to speak with uh, ramana murthy sir or if you have any doubts regarding the session you can please hand so that we will unmute you yeah i think uh, no one is having the doubts sir Okay. Uh, the, uh, heads, uh, I, uh, I thank all participants. Yes. And uh, uh, if if you have uh, even in future any interactions can be done through email. Okay. Um, I I would I would be happy to answer uh, your questions. Thank you for your participation yes. as well. What's my name? Okay. Yes, sir. Name is Anand. Gratitude is the most exquisite form of courtesy. I deem it great privilege to propose vote of thanks on this occasion. No event can take shape without a hard working team. It is the collective effort of the convener Professor K Manoj Kumar and the organizing committee which made this webinar possible. Their determination is praiseworthy. We extend our sincere thanks to all of them. I am very happy to say that the experienced leadership and the unprecedented cooperation of our principal Dr R V Krishnayagaru in providing all the amenities made the hosting of this webinar memorable we will ever remain grateful to you sir most importantly we would like to acknowledge our deep sense of gratitude to our esteemed speaker dr gajal ramanamurthy garu for his valuable time your years of research your depth of understanding and your ability to present the subject in such an interesting way resulted in one of the most memorable and knowledgeable evenings the content you presented today will be echoed in our minds for a long time to come yes. i would like to take this opportunity to thank our director professor n venkatrao garu for supporting us at every crucial juncture we are also grateful to our dean of academics professor k venkatramaya garu and the hod of ece department dr n vijay shankar garu for their valuable suggestions furthermore i would like to extend our thanks to mr v dinesh babu from the department of csc for his cooperation and technical assistance finally let us have a special recognition to all the participants from different states across the country for their active participation in the program we hope that all the participants had an insightful and exuberant session thank you so much for your incredible support once again i would like to state that we are most grateful to the eminent speaker of the program for enlightening us with his presentation before we wind up the session on behalf of chebrol engineering college we sincerely promise you that in the coming days we do keep organizing such proceedings to instill more knowledge and nourish your minds we shall soon meet you in the virtual space with another webinar stay safe and stay healthy thank you very much thank you